If you would, remain standing as we hear from the book of Ecclesiastes in the fourth chapter. Hear this. Again I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun. Look, the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors there was power with no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who have already died more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from one person's envy of another. This also is vanity and a chasing after wind. Fools fold their hands and consume their own flesh. Better is a handful with quiet than two handfuls with toil and a chasing after wind. Again, I saw vanity under the sun, the case of solitary individuals without sons or brothers, yet there is no end to all their toil, and their eyes are never satisfied with riches. For whom am I toiling, they ask, and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other, but woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I would describe her nice. Aww. I guess. You could describe. <laughs> I, have, I have two words goofy and sweet. Mm -hmm. His nickname is Sweet Tea. I feel like I'm a good mom because he is a good dad and taught me how to love. He taught me the importance of church and the importance of serving and the importance of just like making really quality connections. Mary always asks me what's for dinner. Uh-huh. I like to know what's for dinner. And then two hours later she asked me again. And sometimes I forget. Working with John is um yeah, I mean, I think Colin clearly looks up to me a lot, uh, has great admiration for me, uh, tremendous respect for me. Sometimes he's in awe of me, and that's a little uncomfortable for me. That I may have to kiss her or hug her a lot. That is what I don't like. <laughs> John is visiting family in Hawaii, so today you get his faithful disciple, I guess. Uh, we're grateful that you're in worship today as we continue the series on relationship goals. Today, talking about what it means to be in harmonious relationship with one another. But before we do that, let us pray together. Holy God, we give you thanks for these people and this place. We especially give you thanks for your spirit that is also with us, shaping us in your image, challenging us, encouraging us, speaking to us even now. We ask that through your words today, we might be transformed into people that draw others to you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was reflecting this week on what it means to be in relationship, harmonious relationship, and reading this text of Ecclesiastes, I thought about my working relationships, like my relationship with John, or my friendships, or my roommates, or my neighbors, or my friends. I especially, however, thought of my most important relationship, that is my relationship with my wife. And so I looked at what the word harmony and harmonious means. Where did it come from? And there's a Greek word, harmos, that literally means joint, to join together two things, one part, another part, seemingly def different, put together, joint, harmos, harmony, harmonious. And my anniversary is coming up, and so we've had a few years together, and we've had to learn to live together. We've had to ask that question, how do we live together? When we first got married, and a little bit before we got married, it was an exciting question. How do we live together? 
The world is open for us. We could do anything. We can choose how we live together. And I think Landon would testify that it became then a frustrating question once we did start living together. How do we live together? (laughs) As she so helpfully and sweetly puts it, your idea of clean and my idea of clean are not the same. How do we then live together? How do we learn to live together? How do we have harmos? joint harmony. One way I think that we've learned to live together is we've taken a handful of road trips together, one this summer, in fact. And I had someone come up to me after one of the last services and say, if you can take a road trip with someone, you can survive anything with that person. And I find that to be true with Landon and I as well. If you're on the road with someone, if you have a road, a traveling companion, you're in confined space for a long period of time. And you might have beautiful conversations, helpful conversations. You might sing together in harmony, learn from one another, and you might also learn each other's bad habits. Landon has learned that though I love to drive, I'm not the greatest driver of all time. And I've learned that I have this magical ability that about 30 minutes or an hour into a car ride, Landon is open mouth, head back asleep. (laughs) How do we live together? How do we learn to journey with one another? I think it's a human question, a spiritual question, a deep longing question in every human heart. How do we make this journey with one another? That's why I think that for as long as people have been recording stories, they've recorded road stories, stories of people on the road taking a journey, as classic as the Odyssey, as William Faulkner's As L.A. Dying, A Family on the Road, to movies that we all love, Thelma and Louise, for me the first vacation movie with Chevy Chase, Easy Rider, and then a new favorite of mine, Mad Max Fury Road, a strange road movie, but a road movie nonetheless, where people learn to live with one another and learn from one another how to take the journey. Though I think the most classic road story is one called On the Road, by Jack Kerouac, a semi-autobiographical story told by a narrator, Sal, about another man named Dean, who he says was, quote, born on the road. That's where the title comes from. This kind of idealistic picture of a man who's always wandering, who's always journeying, and is a sage of sorts. While on the road, Sal and Dean are asked this question. You boys going to get somewhere? or just going? Are you going to get somewhere or just going? And it's not just a question for them, but I think it's a question for us as well. If we're going, if we are wayfaring people, if we're always journeying to something, if we always have something on the horizon, are we going to get somewhere or are we just simply going? I know in my own life I've set these signposts that maybe once I go to this school or get this job or arrive in this city or uh, arrive at this status or this place that I'm there, I've arrived and no longer need to journey. And maybe this is true for you. Once you arrive at that place, you pick a new destination to journey to. Some simply, though, are just journeying for the sake of journeying. One of those people, a father of the faith in Christianity, was St. Augustine, who traveled, who journeyed for the sake of journeying, not just country to country, but in his own spirit, longing and looking for that place where he would find rest and comfort. A journey of the heart, he would say. And he discovered, as we all do, that it's difficult to travel alone. It's good to have a buddy, a companion, a friend along the road in our human and spiritual longing. His journey, if you find it in the Confessions, his famous work, was always in comparison or alongside someone else. His father, his mother, and his best friend, we learn, Olypius, who was sort of a mentor to him, but also his closest friend who he confided in. On his journey to Carthage, and then eventually Milan, and then eventually to his conversion to Christianity, All along the way, his companion, Olypius, was there in presence or in spirit. And he describes in this relationship how this relationship could be harmonious, joined together, point 
counterpoint, friend, companion, or discord, disharmony, ugliness, and friction. Augustine found that when they compromised, when they worked together, when they gave themselves to each other, the relationship went well. But when they were alone and solitary, when they tried to be self-sufficient and autonomous, it didn't work. Augustine found, as we all do, that when we give ourselves to another, whether in romance and marriage or friendship or siblinghood or parent and child relationship or at work, when we give ourselves to another person wholly, it can enrich the relationship. You can assist one another when the other needs help. You can bolster and encourage the other one in their dreams and aspirations, and your relationship deepens. Likewise, the opposite is true. If you do not give yourself fully to another person, your relationship is ruined. You can hurt one another rather than assist one another. You can weaken rather than encourage and strengthen. And you find that your relationship is not deep, but shallow and superficial. My wife is a Montessori teacher, and she teaches 22 two to six-year-olds. So, you know, when you learn from another person, I'm learning about patience and resiliency from her. We went to a parenting class the other night, and the teacher described to us what she thinks that children need to know that they belong, to know that they are loved, to know that they are encircled by their parents. She described these gems, G-E-Ms, genuine encounter moments. And she said they're hard to come by now in our culture because we're trained not to have these. She says they don't include our cell phones. They don't include the television. They include face-to-face interaction. So maybe even some moments of boredom and awkwardness, but playing on the floor, imagining together, taking a long walk, sharing in a long conversation. These genuine encounter moments transform a child's life that they might know that they are loved, that they matter, that their presence is important. The teacher also reminded us that it's not just children that need these genuine encounters. We do too. Every day, we know this from our own personal experience, we know whether or not someone is fully present with us, that someone is genuinely encountering us, that someone sees us and loves us and cares for us and is encircling us. This loneliness, what Mother Teresa called the leprosy of our generation, plagues people, destroys people, hurts people, looms over people. Freddie Mercury, the singer of Queen, describes how he is surrounded by millions of people, people that adored him, that loved him, that idolized him. He made uh, millions of pounds, as he said, but still felt like the loneliest man. Someone like that, surrounded by all these people that seemed to care about, it and, uh, care about him and love him, he still felt deeply lonely. It's not just him, it's something that Ecclesiastes points to, a human condition, our loneliness, our isolation, our alienation. And what the author of Ecclesiastes argues is the cure is, is companionship. On the journey, on the road with one another, to have someone And this is what he describes, that two are better than one. You've probably heard this before. Because they have a good reward for their toil. And his argument is not that the reward is what you create together, but the reward is the relationship itself. And here's what he describes. One may fall into a ditch, and another one is there to lift them out. One may find in camping that they are cold, but they have someone with them to warm them. One may be ambushed on the road by someone who wishes them harm or wishes to take from them, but with two, they're able to withstand the threat. It's clear to commentators and it's clear to me that the metaphor that Ecclesiastes is dealing with is the road, the journey, the way that we all take, that as we journey, we might and probably will fall down in the ditch, that on the road, we might have to take a moment to camp And if we're alone, we're isolated and cold. We need someone to keep us warm. And on the road, there's dangers, and there are those and uh, people and in forces that wish us harm and wish to take from us, though with a companion, we're able to withstand that. The author of Ecclesiastes puts it, I think, in a little bit harsh terms. It's foolish to go it alone. It's foolish to walk the road by yourself. It's 
foolish to think that you can do it all by yourself. But the wise person, wisdom is to have a traveling companion. Easier said than done, I think. Because we're gen generally taught what he calls foolishness, extreme individualism and autonomy, that you can only trust yourself with yourself, that going on your own is the best way, that you only need you, that you're the smartest person in the room. As Fleetwood Mac would say, you can go your own way. And we saw how it worked out for them. That if you give of yourself to another that you are binding yourself, you're giving an authentic piece of your life away. What Ecclesiastes and what I think the gospel teaches is the opposite. That to give of yourself to another, to compromise, to share your life with a companion, not just in marriage, but in friendship, in work, in life, in neighborhood in general, is the scaffolding of a good life, is wisdom for all time, is good in and of itself. The reward is the relationship, and it doesn't bind you, but it's liberating. It makes you free to walk the road without the fear that if you fall down, you're never going to get back up, or that if you're cold, that you're going to freeze to death, or that if you're ambushed, you might as well give up. It's liberating to know you have someone to walk with you. There's a book of moral philosophy written by Tim Scanlon called What We Owe to Each Other, and it's a deep philosophical book. I've never read it. Uh, I don't plan to but I learned that it's actually the backbone of one of my favorite television shows, The Good Place. Uh, four people find themselves having passed away in The Good Place, uh, met by Ted Danson, and over the course of the series, they learn that they need each other. One of the characters, Chidi Adagonye, is a professor of moral philosophy in Australia, and he references this work. And the conclusion they come to is that what we owe to each other is not stuff or material goods or money. What we owe to each other is each other. What we can give to another is ourself, our companionship, our hands to hold, our lifting up, our keeping warm, our defense against ambush. Maybe you have examples of this in your own life, but the things that come to mind for me are that I've begun this mentoring relationship with a student at Hollybrook Elementary School. And what a lot of people testify about these mentoring relationships is not that they find that this kid really needed me, but that the mentor needed the child too. We need each other, and what we owe to each other is each other. Jennifer can testify to the fact that when home groups have a deep, longing relationship to be with one another, to share with one another, to grow in their faith, they learn that they need each other. They owe each other each other. I find this in my own work in Alpha and having conversations about faith and life and meaning that we can't answer those questions, we can't walk the road of doubt and confusion and learning alone, but we need each other to learn. And maybe you've found that place, and unfortunately I think too often we put the onus of finding a companion on the lonely. But I think it's up to us, to, to followers of Jesus, to those who may already have companions, to invite others on the way, those that have fallen in the ditch, those that have found themselves cold and alienated, those who have been ambushed, to offer them a hand to lift them up, to warm them, to defend them. That's why we love these road movies so much is because we find those deepening relationships played out before us, where they couldn't do it alone, and there's always a moment where they try to do it alone and it doesn't work. Can we offer ourselves to journey with one another in harmony? Can we say, I'll drive for a little bit if you'll drive the next half? I'll let you rest while I work. I'll defend you if you're ambushed. I'll keep you warm if you find yourself cold and alienated. I'll help you up, not if, but when you fall down. That's what Olypius did for Augustine. That's what we do with each other in the church. That's what we find in our marriages and our friendships if we find harmony, if we join. There's this curious part, this, this last piece of Scripture that we read today that you might have heard preached at a wedding before, maybe your own wedding. Though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. 
And then a three-fold cord is not quickly broken. Most of the time this is interpreted as, as in a marriage relationship, there's you, there's your partner, and there's Jesus in the middle of it. And I don't think that's a bad reading. It's not clear from the text, but I think it might be helpful in this sense. That God is always with us. As, as John Wesley said, that's the best news that there is. That when we are cold and alienated, maybe Jesus is the only harmonious companion we can find, that third chord, the one who walks with us and sometimes we ask to drive. This third chord, this person, this God-man who came to be with us that we might not be alienated, that we might be lifted up, that we might be defended from ambush. That's of comfort to me, but I find it only when I find it in others. This body, this group, this ragtag community of people who long to give of ourselves and long to receive the love of other people. That's what harmonious relationship is about. Not someone being in charge and the others following along, but us in mutuality giving each other to each other. That the question is not simply, as Jack Kerouac put it, are you going to get somewhere or just going, but no matter where you're going, who are you going with? In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for that good news above all good news that you are with us, that you are our companion, that you walk with us, that you never leave us, that you never forsake us. Help us be that for someone else. Transform our hearts and our lives that we might show your love to another in our assistance, in our warmth, in our defense. Form us in your image in that way, that others might know you. In Jesus' name, amen.